Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University. And in this video, we're going to talk about some of the general issues about wood connections and tim timber connections. Same thing, wood timber connections. And uh, about some of the geometry of connections that's going to be common about all the connection types that we talk about. So first thing I want to talk about, just reiterating something that I said in the previous videos, was that uh, timber connections are really critical. And the connections between timber elements and between timber elements and other elements are often the weakest link in timber structures. So connection design is uh, really one of the most important considerations when we build timber structures. Um, and there's a lot of things that can affect the strength of those. Um, some of those are uh, just things that uh, affect timber generally. Of course, moisture content we know affects strength and stiffness. But uh, also, at the connections, we can run into problems depending on how we lay them out. And we looked at this in the previous video. Uh, we looked at, you know, what could be the potential problem if we put timber directly in contact with concrete or masonry, which is that we can get uh, moisture problems at those connections, which could lead to rot and uh, which could lead to um, bad uh, future outcomes. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about before was temperature problems that we could run into in wood steel connections. Um, you know, if I have really, really wide temperature swings and I have steel connected to timber, for example, then uh, there is a possibility that um, um, the steel and the timber have different coefficients of thermal expansion. So one could um, tug or pull on the other in ways that we don't expect. But, you know, we would expect those kind of issues to happen um, for kind of much uh, large, large types of connections. Okay, so I want to cover some of the general kind of guidelines, things that we should consider when we make timber connections, things that we should avoid. Um, one of the things is uh, the problems with moisture sometimes can be at least partially mitigated by making sure that when we actually form the connections of the structure, we are doing that at the time when our timber has more or less reached a reasonable equilibrium moisture content, similar to what it's going to be in service. Uh, we can run into a problem with this, for example, if we um, bring our material to site and we store it outside and then uh, we leave it out there for a while, the material gets wet. I mean, it's it's required to come to site under certain equal, uh, certain moisture content, right? But then uh, it sits out on the site, it gets wet uh, from rain. And um, then when we go to install the connections, we install them basically in the wet condition. And then, of course, once the material dries, um, it's going to experience significant shrinkage relative to the point when it was installed. And then we could um, develop some cracks and um, that could cause problems for the strengths of our connections. Uh, this is a problem that we wouldn't run into if we um, were installing timber at the same condition that it was going to um, that it was going to um, um, live at, basically. Um, another related idea there is in the standard, it actually says specifically that um, when we install timber connections, uh, especially if we install them wet, we have to go back and make sure that all the bolts are tight later because um, if, um, if we install the bolts when it's wet, then when things shrink, the bolts could then become loose and, um, you know, then, then we could have potentially an unstable kind of connection. So we have to go back later and, and tighten them up if, if that is the case. Um, I just mentioned that we should prevent contact with concrete or masonry. So that makes sense for the reasons that we talked about. Concrete and masonry um, are real attractive to water and water can soak through and through capillary action can move through concrete or masonry pretty easily. And if we put timber in direct contact with them, then um, that moisture, which doesn't affect the strength of the concrete, could seep into the timber and then reduce its, uh, reduce its strength. And if its moisture is there for a long time, could also cause rot. Um, the best way to load a piece of wood, uh, we're talking about connections, is to load in direct compression. So, I mean, the best way to load a piece of wood in direct compression is parallel to grain but it is typically in connections. One thing that we talked about in the kind of tips video is that it's always better, typically better to, if I'm making a connection to have most of the load be transferred in bearing. Like if I have a beam coming and having it sit on some kind of seat, 
is really the best, most efficient way to connect it rather than relying on, for example, shear and bolts um, for that kind of connection. So whenever possible, I should try to think of ways where I can connect things using direct compression. Compression parallel, the best, but you know, even compression perpendicular is better than um, certainly relying on the splitting strength of a piece of wood. Another thing is that we want to typically avoid concentrating load in one spot. And that also has to do with tension perpendicular to grain strength. I'm just going to draw a picture to explain a bit more why that's the case. Okay, so let's first look at the situation on the left where we have kind of a large fastener in a hole. I'm showing this hole as very oversized, but of course it's not exact, that, that's a bit exaggerated. But really when this, um, uh, when this bolt is pushing against the hole, um, part of the diameter of that bolt is kind of sitting at that uh, inner edge of the hole. And that means that I'm going to have loads. I mean, I'm going to have a, a load distribution on the front of that hole that's going to look something like this, right? So of course I do have loads in the horizontal direction, but I'm going to have a direct bearing, which is going to create these kind of loads that also push outward from the hole, right? So I have a bolt, the bolt is in a circular hole and that bolt, um, push, pushes outward a bit. Let me take this nut off. That bolt pushes outward up this direction and down this direction as it's pushing to the side, right? Like you can imagine that if I have kind of a gap here um, and I try to push this bolt through, um, you know, if I have a gap here, it's not going to prevent the bolt from coming through. As I push this bolt through, it's going to push a bit up on the top and a bit down on the bottom and open that gap to come through. So you can imagine like my fingers coming together here is like just being restrained by the strength of the lignin, right? Which is what's holding the fibers together in the wood. And so as I push through, this bolt can, can kind of push those fibers apart and overcome the strength of the lignin in tension perpendicular and cause splitting and eventually come through the edge of that hole. So I could end up with um, a split along this line. And the bigger the fastener, you know, the bigger those, um, those kind of diagonal force effects are going to be, right? Which way should I do it? This way, right? The bigger those diagonal force effects are going to be. Um, <clears throat> because the more load there is on that particular bolt. Um, so it is often more efficient to use many smaller fasteners so that I don't get a large localized tension perpendicular stress, which is what those two arrows, which are going this way, what those two arrows, which are kind of diverging apart, are causing a tension perpendicular splitting. So to avoid that problem, uh, you know, it's, it's often better not to use uh, really large diameter connectors whenever possible. Now, um, one kind of exception there is, um, you know, if we're using split rings or shear plates, the whole idea is to spread that load around over a larger area. So it's kind of trying to serve the same purpose as the situation on the right. So I wouldn't really consider that a, a, um, uh, the same kind of problem. Okay, so we know that the uh, weakest way to load a piece of wood is tension perpendicular, which is basically pulling these fibers apart because the only thing holding those fibers together is the lignin in the wood. And that lignin, which binds all the fibers together, is very much weaker than the fibers themselves. So it's the worst way that we can load a piece of wood is tension perpendicular. And just like the problem that we were just talking about, the problem of the large diameter fastener causing tension perpendicular and then causing premature splitting, uh, there are other ways that we can get that right. One that we already looked at quite a bit when we talked about shear is the problem of notch shear because notch shear effectively at that um, weak point um, at the re-entrant notch 
um, has a large tension perpendicular stress, which is what can cause splitting and premature failure when I have a notch. Right, so that's one that we talked about. Another one that we mentioned briefly in the previous video about um, hangers is that, you know, if I want to hang something off of a piece of wood, um, there are some good ways to do it, and there are some better ways to do it, and there are some kind of best ways to do it. Okay, so on the left here, this is I want to hang something from a piece of wood and I have a um, like this is a wood beam and I have a steel plate that I've bolted to the side of the beam. We saw in the previous video that, you know, this would be a particularly, particularly bad kind of connection. So I've put those bolts very low. So my splitting resistance is also going to be very low. Um, we saw that one thing that we could do for that is to basically move the bolts up so I can make my connection look more like this where my bolts are near to the top. Now that's a bit better, but still my failure here is going to be splitting uh, along this bolt line basically. So this is not so good. This is, you know, I can find the resistance for it, but it's not a great detail. A much better detail is instead of bolting to the side of the member is going over the top, you know, and so if I have a, p a plate and it's kind of U-shaped going over the top of the piece of wood, I'll draw kind of the top plate is there behind. And so now if I pull on this, I'm not pulling on some bolts, tension perpendicular, I'm pulling, um, I'm basically transferring that load in compression, perpendicular to grain, right? Compression right here. So this is a much better. Now I'm still probably going to need some bolt here just to keep it in place. But now it's not the bolt that's transferring the load. It's the, um, it's the seat, basically the saddle on top that is uh, transferring that hanger load. So that's much better. Okay, so one thing that we have to deal with a lot in connection design is the difference between a single shear connection and a double shear connection. I just want to spend some time here on what this means. Um, here I have two different cases, one that has two members. Um, these are both wood members joined together and one that has um, three timber members joined together. Um, Okay, on the left and right. So the one on the left is a wood-wood connection, which means two pieces of wood. The one on the right, we would call that a wood-wood-wood connection. So there is uh, three pieces of wood. There are three pieces of wood, and these are joined by a bolt. And I have kind of left here, I've kind of shown these holes as being kind of very, very oversized. And here I'm drawing kind of where the hole is. And so you can tell which way this connection is being um, loaded. Okay, so on the left, we have two pieces of wood. Uh, one is pulling one way, one is pulling the other. And so they are shearing effectively that bolt. And if I have a load on this connection, I'm going to have one P here. And the other side of the connection has to resist basically that full, that full load P. Okay, so I have P on the right, P on the left, my load is P, and I have two wood members. Okay, the one on the left, I have what's called uh, one shear plane. And here, this is basically the shear plane here, this orange. Maybe orange is not the best because it doesn't show up. Let's call it, uh, let's do purple. Okay, I have one shear plane here. Okay, and that shear plane, I mean, it's called a plane because it's a flat plane and it's basically the intersection point between those two members. And there's one plane on which those members will slide relative to each other. And the blue bolt is um, holding it all together. And um, 
it is also providing totally the resistance to sliding these between these two members. I mean, we ignore the friction on that shear plane when we look at the strength. So that bolt at that interface is going to need to be sheared, right? Like, so I'm going to have a shear load, um, a shear load basically on the bolt at that interface. So one side is pulling the bolt one way, one side is pulling the bolt the other way, right at that interface, there is kind of a shear right at that point that's trying to shear the bolt off. So the, the bolt is being sheared in one location at one shear plane. And so we call that a single shear kind of connection. Okay. And if I were to look at the shear in the bolt at that location, so if I were to draw kind of a shear diagram, this is very simplified, okay, because this is not really the true distribution of the shear. But let's simplify it like this, and assuming that I had just like point loads and that the end of the bolt cannot rotate and, and all that stuff, then my shear diagram is going to look something like um, this, right? I'm just going to have constant shear between those two, and the value of that constant shear in the bolt is going to be P. Okay, so now let's look at the situation on the right. On the right, I have, let's say I have a total load P on the right side, and I have now two members on the left side of the um, connection. So these two members are going to equally share that total load P. So there's going to be P over two on one and P over two on the other. Okay. And if I'm going to identify where this bolt is going to be sheared, there are now two different shear planes, one here and one here. And these are the locations where the bolt is being sheared. Uh, right at that shear plane. I'm shearing the bolt. So I'm pulling one way on one side and the other way on the other side and shearing that bolt. Okay, so here there are now two shear planes. And so now if I look at kind of a somewhat pretend free body diagram, I have P on one side, P over two here, P over two here. And if I look at what the shear is going to be, Then if I were considering this bolt like it was a beam, I would have a shear that looks something like um, this. Maybe I'll make it the same direction as the other one. And the value of this shear is going to be P over 2 on both sides. So basically the benefit of the two shear planes is it actually halves the shear in the bolt. So now my bolt has half the shear than it used to have. Okay, and I haven't changed the overall loads. I've just basically um, split the resistance into two sides, one on one side of the bolt and one on the other side of the bolt. And I mean, this is, if you've done steel design, this is the same situation in shear where we need to look at the number of shear planes. Um, yeah, so that's one shear plane versus two shear planes. Uh, I'm just gonna draw a few other examples of what one shear plane connections might look like and what other two shear plane connections might look like. Okay, here's an example of a single shear plane connection. So you can see there's just one shear plane between the steel plate and the wood member. And this is an example of a nailed connection. So I have a nail that joins the steel from the wood. And of course, I can only put that nail in from one side. I can only nail from the steel into the wood. And of course, in the steel, I'll need to have a little hole to accept the nail. But this one we would call a steel wood connection. So just one piece of steel attached um, to the side of a piece of wood. I could have used a bolt for this as well. Um, let's look at some of the steel and wood um, two shear plane connections. Okay, here we have a steel wood steel connection. So this is when I have steel plates on either side of the wood element. And um, here I have a bolt. I cannot do this type of connection with a nail because um, I can't get the nail from the steel through the wood and then embedded in the last piece of steel. 
Uh, if I wanted to do nails with a connection like this, I would have to basically consider this to be two separate steel wood connections and go nails from one side and nails from the other. But I, um, I won't have two shear planes then. So this is uh, basically two shear plane connection for a bolted connection and a steel wood steel connection. And um, you can see basically where the two shear planes are, one between the steel and wood at the top and one between the steel and wood on the bottom. And there's just going to show one last example, which is the opposite. Okay, so this is a wood steel wood connection. Now this could be two separate pieces of wood and a piece of steel in the middle, certainly. Um, but maybe a common way to see this kind of connection, wood, steel, wood, is basically it's the same piece of wood, but with a slot, a knife, a knife cut, uh, not knife cut, but you know, like a slot cut out in the center, and the steel knife plate fit inside the slot. But then at the connection location, which in this case I've shown as a steel dowel, but could also be a bolt, could also be a nail, um, at that location there is wood, then steel, then wood, and there are two shear planes on the dowel. Those shear planes are at the top of the steel plate and the bottom of the steel plate. Now here I've shown a dowel just, you know, in the interest of showing different things. Um, remember dowels, steel dowels, we design them the same way as bolts, but the difference is that we have tight tolerance on the hole. So basically the dowel is pushed right into the hole and the hole is the same size as the dowel and the dowel is friction fit inside the hole, which is different for the ones that I've drawn above where basically the hole is bigger than the bolt. Okay, so that's um, single shear plane connections on the left and double shear plane type connections on the right for bolts and, um, and also nails. And a few examples for each. <clears throat> okay, now let's say that I have a connection and I'm calculating shear strength of my member. Okay, so let's say we have a member and that member is connected to some other member. So the shear in the member is caused by these um, other connected elements. Okay, and um, those elements are connected to the side of the member like this, for example, with a bolted or nailed connection. Then when I calculate my VR, my longitudinal shear resistance, I'm not permitted to use the full member depth. And I mean, the clauses are there to say why we can't or say that we can't. Um, basically what's going to happen is these uh, members are going to be subject to splitting, which we talked about. I mean, if I have the side of my member and I put some bolts on here and I pull down on those bolts, I'm going to have um, splitting. So basically what it says is you can't, um, if I am putting some bolts here and pulling down, I basically can't consider any of the wood above as being effective in resisting the shear. So only the wood below is going to basically resist that shear. And I'm assuming that the wood above is completely gone. Now, whether I consider above or below, it depends on which way the load is um, pointing in the member. And so what it says in the standard is that we take the distance between the, um, the farthest distance between whatever bolt group we're using and the loaded edge. And so a lot hinges on this definition of the loaded edge. So the loaded edge basically depends on which direction my load is going. So let's say for this left one here, I am applying a compression load to the diagonal element and that element is pushing into that beam and it's causing a shear and we need to calculate the shear resistance at this section. What is the area that we're gonna use for the VR calculation? Well, that area is going to need a certain depth of the beam. And we already talked about the fact that we are not going to be permitted to consider the entire depth. So then we have to consider the distance between the bolt group and the uh, loaded edge. So which side is the loaded edge? The loaded edge is basically the side that my load arrow here points to. If I had, uh, you know, like a free body diagram here. 
So for this section on the left, I'm going to kind of split these because they're going to be different. For the one on the left, the loaded edge is going to be this edge on the bottom. Loaded edge of the member. And we're going to talk more about loaded ends and edges when we talk about bolt geometry, like bolted connection geometry. And this one on the top is going to be an unloaded edge. Okay, so basically this load is pushing down, pushing down on this beam here, and it's pushing towards this bottom edge. Okay, it's pushing towards the bottom edge and away from the top edge. So the top edge in this case is the unloaded edge and the bottom edge is the loaded edge. Okay, so now how do I calculate my effective depth for calculating shear? It's basically the farthest point on this bolt group down to the loaded edge. So this is gonna be my effective depth, DE. So now if I need to calculate my net area for shear, I'm gonna use that effective depth times the width instead of using the total depth. So this here, like if I were to look at my bolt group kind of as a group here, this is kind of my bolt group area, and I'm gonna go from the farthest bolt uh, down to the loaded edge. Okay, so what about on the right? If I have a tension load in this one like this, so now I'm pulling up on the member. So my, my diagonal member here is bolted to my horizontal beam and it wants to pull up. It's pulling towards the top edge. So now the top edge is my loaded edge and the bottom edge is my unloaded edge. Just gonna remind you which direction the grain is in here. Okay, so what's my effective depth now? It's going to be the loaded edge to the farthest bolt. So it's going to be this depth here. This is my DE, my effective depth for the condition on the right. Okay, so this arrow and this arrow, we can say they points, they point or it points towards the loaded edge. And that's how you remember which one is the loaded one and which one is the unloaded one. Okay, so what about modification factors now for connections? We talked all about modification factors when we were talking about beam design and everything. We talked about our duration factor. We talked about our um, treatment factor. We talked about system factor. Now duration factor is the same as before. So KD is gonna be the same. It depends on the, um, the term of the loading, the duration of the loading. Um, we, um, uh, KH is not gonna apply in the same way, but um, we do have service condition factors. So these are our KS factors, if you recall. And for fasteners, we're gonna have KSF for service condition for, fact, for fasteners. And um, this is a separate table that's gonna be found in chapter 12. So chapter 12 is where all of our connection design details are in the standard. And if we look at that table, it looks like this. This is a service condition factor table for connections. And um, you can see it depends, as I was saying there, on fabrication process, type of connection, and type of loading. Okay, so depending on what kind of connection we have, so we have timber rivets, uh, we have things for split rings, shear plate connectors, and truss plates, so we're not going to run into that. Uh, but we have here bolts, dowels, drift pins, and lag screws has one set, and nails, spikes, and wood screws are another set. So let's start with nails. You know, if I have a nail, um, driven into my section here, uh, I'm going to have a different service condition factor, first of all, depending on whether I am loading it in withdrawal, which I don't tend to do for nails, but you see that wood screws are involved there too. So if I have withdrawal, or if I have lateral loads, which means I'm basically pulling the nail this way, or on the inner, you know, in the inner, in the plane of the wood member. So if I have nail here, and I'm pulling that nail this way, or I'm pulling that nail this way, those are both lateral loads. 
Okay, so lateral loads and withdrawal loads, we have a different we have a different um, a different row here. Okay, so lateral loads and withdrawal loads. And then we have here a criteria for is the moisture content of the wood, uh, what was the moisture content of the wood when the connection was fabricated? So we talked earlier on in this particular lesson about how um, it's important to consider um, moisture con content at the time of putting all of the connections together. Because if we start green, um, we are potentially going to um, um, have shrinkage, which is going to cause splitting potentially, and which is going to reduce the strength of the connection. So you can see here that if we start with um, um, green wood, like if we start with very wet wood when we install it, that's greater than 19% moisture content, then you can see that the, uh, the moisture content um, service condition factor is lower than it is if we are putting it together when it's dry. Okay, so this is important because if I assume that the connection is going to go together with dry wood, like the wood didn't get wet before we installed it, <clears throat> then I have one set of factors, but if they mishandle the, the wood material on site and they install it green, then I'm going to get lower strengths. So this is important. So that's, that's for when it was installed, dry versus green. Now the second row down here is what is the service condition factor during operation? So is this thing an interior connection, for example, and it's gonna be dry, or is it an exterior connection, it's gonna be wet? So you can see here, like if we installed it dry and it's gonna remain dry, then my KSF is one, which we would expect. Okay, so I don't have a service condition reduction. But if even if the service condition is dry, like it's gonna be inside, for example, during its entire uh, lifespan, but we installed it green, like we installed it very wet, then I'm going to have to reduce to, uh, I'm going to have to reduce my strength by 20% for lateral loads. Okay, so um, considering the situation on site is um, important. So we want to keep our wood dry when it's on site um, so that we don't run into this problem. Okay, um, connection detail, there's no split for connection detail for nails and spikes. And then uh, angle of load to grain, uh, you see for lateral loads, it doesn't matter which angle to grain I go. You know, if I go this way or if I go this way or if I go in the same direction of grain, it's going to be all the same for nails. It's because nails are small. And uh, for withdrawal loads, withdrawal loads are just always 90% to, uh, to grain. They, they're always perpendicular to grain. Um, I'm not permitted to do this. <clears throat> Um, with um, with nails, certainly. Okay, so um, yeah, what about for bolts? Okay, so for bolts, it's the same situation, dry installation, green installation, dry service, wet service. Um, but here we have different kinds of connection details and the connection details are listed underneath, which you may not be able to reach here, but you know, if I have a single fastener or single row parallel to grain with steel splice plates, then I am connection type A, and I'm going to use these parameters. Okay, we're going to talk about what is a single row parallel to grain uh, and what are rows parallel to grain, etc. in a minute. If I have a single row parallel to grain with wood splice plates, or I have two rows parallel to grain not more than 127 millimeters apart with common wood splice plate, or I have multiple rows with separate wood or steel splice plates for each row, then I have the B condition. Okay, which is actually the same as the A condition. And then um, for if I'm applying uh, in the direction of the grain and has reduced properties for wet installation if I'm uh, applying load in the 90% direction to grain. And then any situation that doesn't fit under A or B is basically situation C and I'm gonna use these worst case um, moisture content uh, service condition factors. Okay, so that's generally how that table works. It'll be clearer um, uh, with an example, with the examples later, basically. Okay, so now let's talk about what it means to have um, multiple rows and what's a row and what's a column. If I have a group of fasteners. Okay, so this applies to um, whatever kind of fasteners we're talking about. The definition of what's a row um, stays the same. <clears throat> 
Okay, so here I basically have two identical layouts for bolts on an identical member. Okay, so we're going to find that how we consider how many rows of bolts we have depends on which direction the load is. So for example, if I am pulling on these bolts or nails or rivets or whatever in the direction parallel to the, um, to the member, okay, so, you know, I could have a steel plate attached to those bolts and I'm pulling on the steel plate and the plate is pulling on the bolts and the bolts are pulling on the member and this is the general direction of the force. Then this we would consider to be two rows. So it's one row. Um, let's do it like this. One row, two rows. Okay, so this would call, this would be called two rows. Okay, if... Instead, we had our load being pulled this way, then this would be a case where we have three rows. Oops. Okay, so the rows are, are, are the lines of bolts in the direction of the loading. So it doesn't have to do with the grain of the wood, it has to do with which direction are the bolts being loaded. Okay, so um, the rows are parallel with the direction of loading. Okay, so that's to sum it up. Um, okay, and uh, there are also a bunch of spacing requirements that we're going to need to consider. Okay, and all those are the different um, spacing requirements that we're going to run into. You know, we need to space between the rows of fasteners. So that would be, um, that would be this distance here. Okay, we need space between fasteners within a row. So that would be this distance here. Okay, we need distance between fasteners and a loaded or unloaded edge. This is an edge here, okay? Edge is the side of a piece of wood. So here's the end, the edge, okay? And um, we also have an end distance and the end is not shown here, but this would be like to the end of the piece of wood. So if the piece of wood came to an end out here, then that would be the distance between the fastener and the end of the piece of wood. Okay, so those are all of the different things that we're, We'll talk about those in more detail when we um, um, when we talk about the details of connection design for different types of connections. Okay, and fa fastener, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it before, is a nail is a fastener, a bolt is a type of fastener, a timber rivet is a type of fastener, a um, shear plate is a type of fastener. Okay, so these are all types of fasteners. Fastener is just the general term. Okay, so another thing that we might run into and this is just kind of a grab bag of all the different um, fastener geometry conditions that we will run into and how we define them and, and, uh, and stuff is if we have staggered lines of fasteners. Okay, so staggered lines of fasteners means they're not laid out in like an equal rectangular matrix. They're kind of staggered like this. Okay, so they are like in one row is kind of offset by half the distance uh, in the next row. And so we can have that as really close together, like on the left, or maybe we can also have that staggering be really far apart like this. Okay, and whether I consider this to be one row of bolts or two rows of bolts in the longitudinal direction depends on how tight that stagger is. Okay, and the reason is because, you know, like if I have something like this on the left, then conceivably I could get a failure where the, and we haven't talked about exactly how these failures work, but I could get a failure where each of these rows pulls out of the end of the member um, separately. So then I'm considering basically two rows of material being pulled out. 
and that would be for a kind of tight stagger. But for the one on the left, or on the right, you could consider maybe that, you know, I might get some kind of failure that propagates through the material more like this, and maybe comes out as just kind of one sheer plug being pulled out, um, instead of having to consider them as two. So you could see that that would be the case kind of in the extremes. Okay, so then if I wanted to find the geometry for this, I need to consider um, two different parameters. Okay, the, I'm just drawing the same thing kind of um, here again, blowing up a little bit. And one thing that I need to consider is this parameter A. And A is the distance between these adjacent rows. Like considering first that, you know, I have basically two rows of staggered fasteners. Okay, so that's A, which is the A equals the distance between the rows. This is before we've decided if we're considering this to be one row or two. Distance between the rows. Okay, then I have to consider this parameter S. And S is the distance between fasteners in adjacent rows. So I start at one fastener here, and I move until I hit the next fastener in the row next to it. And that would be my S. Okay, now depending on the relative value of S and A, I will consider whether this is one row or two rows when I go to calculate the strength. And we'll see, like when we calculate row shear, we need to know what the rows are. So uh, this is the way that that works. So Okay, so in the first case, if S is greater than 4A, which means it's more like the second situation here than the first situation, so it's a very kind of long stagger. If S is four times the A, so if I have like a four to one ratio between S and A, then I'm considering one row. So my row looks like this, and my spacing is this. So that makes sense. If it's one row, that's the spacing between the bolts in the row. Okay, if I'm looking at two, if, if I'm looking at S is less than 4A, so the spacing, dagger is um, kind of more sharp, then I'm considering two rows, but with a spacing of 2s. So then I'm considering two rows like this, and now my spacing is my actual in-row spacing, which is uh, equal to 2s, or basically whatever my actual in-row spacing is, that's what I'm going to use. Okay, so that's that's the difference. So I just need to know Depending on a stagger situation, um, on the stagger geometry, do I consider this one row? Do I consider this two rows? And then what is my in-row spacing, like my spacing between bolts um, in a single row? Of course, I should specify that the load is in this direction when we're talking about the rows. Okay, just a couple more brief things to cover. First, having to do um, with the um, with the net section requirement. Okay, so this is mostly applicable to bolts. Okay, you can imagine if I'm calculating my net section now, um, which I have to often do, especially if I want to find the tension resistance of this uh, section, and I have staggered bolts, you know, you can imagine, do I consider just this as the net section? Like, do I only remove one volt from my net section, uh, my, my A, to get my AN? Or are these close enough that we're likely to have, you know, let me, um, let me put this both a little bit closer here, you know, or are these close enough that basically my net section is going to look something like this? These are the two situations. So do I have to remove one bolt hole size from my net section or do I have to remove two? So basically, if the requirement is, um, I need to look at the spacing between the, uh, the two bolts. So I'm going to do this in orange. So this is the spacing here. 
for this spacing here, I'm going to say if spacing shown is less than, and I'm not talking about uh, my row distances or anything like that. It's just if this is less than 8 times df, where df is the, di the diameter of the fastener, then we consider they are in the same net section. Okay, where df is the fastener diameter. So I check this, less than 8f, question mark, less than 8f, question mark. That's what I have to check. If it's greater than 8f, then I can take one net section has one bolt, the next net section also has one bolt. If it's less than 8f, then I have the situation of the green line on the right, where both of these are part of the same net section. So I have to remove both bolt hole sizes when I calculate my net area AN. Okay, what about that hole size? We've kind of touched on this inside examples before. But we know that when we use a bolt, we have to cut a hole to put the bolt in. And we know that that hole is going to be um, bigger than the bolt itself. Okay, so the requirement is that when I cut a bolt for a hole, when I cut a, when I cut a hole for a bolt, so the bolt has to go through a hole, the hole has to be a bit bigger, uh, it's a requirement of the standard that that hole can only be at most two millimeters bigger than the bolt diameter. So if my bolt diameter, if there's a half inch bolt and it's 13 millimeters in diameter, then my hole cannot be any greater than 15 millimeters in diameter. So that means that when I'm assuming for my design how big the hole is, I can just take my bolt diameter and add two millimeters. And I should definitely take that into um, account when I do my calculations because the bolt hole being bigger than the bolt is going to eat into my net section. So my net section will be smaller. So the best assumption is to um, include consideration of the fact that the hole is going to be a bit bigger than the bolt. And I do that in all my examples. Okay, so we've looked at uh, in this video uh, all of the different geometry considerations and some, some additional tips for design and things that we need to consider when we're designing connections. And going forward, we're going to dive into the actual details of how do I calculate um, nailed and bolted uh, connection strengths.